to the brethren who are watching us on live stream as well. Uh, you're, you are a great encouragement to us in your faith, uh, although we're not able to see you in the flesh. That um, you are, every, every time we hear of your faith, we are thankful that you are still striving together with us in the hope of the gospel. So uh, this, this is uh, prayer this morning that I'm going to be speaking from is the last extended discourse which the, the apostles heard that night when he was to be betrayed. And this morning, I, I, I want to specifically look at these few verses where Jesus brings to their attention this divine initiative, this one which was kept secret, so to speak, since the foundation of the world. I, I've been, often been impressed um, by how um, well Jesus um, spoke in this uh, prayer. He chose his words wisely because he knew that this is going to be the last thing that they were going to be able to, to hear from him, the last extended um, thing. I'm going to go ahead and read the text again. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Now this that the Savior has articulated is the, the true purpose for man, even from the beginning of his creation. Uh, we see merely shadows of this in man being made in the image of God. Uh, this is like an outline, so to speak, of the divine plan. Uh, man was made in a preliminary, a primitive, if you will, image of God. It wasn't a complete image. It was an image in that they were able to reason and, and think upon a level that no other creature was. They were like God in this aspect, but they were not like God in their essential nature. Now, God did not make them evil. They were blameless. However, their goodness at the start was a result of their innocence. Uh, they weren't righteous as God was righteous in this sense. And this was evidenced by their instant failure at their very first exposure to deception. But... This imprint of the divine, although it was marred by the fall, it was like a hint towards the man's purpose of being created. As the history of man progressed, we became more introduced to this concept of man being joined to God in identity. As, he, as God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, he was, he was given this promise of blessing and inheritance and the, the sign of circumcision as a separation but between him and the rest of the world and his seed as they came to be. See, they were associated with God in name and in their culture. They were separated unto him from all the, among all the other nations of the earth, and they were given advantages that the rest of the world were not. God made a covenant with them. God gave them a moral code and a law to govern themselves. He separate, made, made a clear separation. Yet despite all of this, there was always a, a, a distance which had to be maintained because of the nature of mankind. Uh, men who were sensitive throughout the ages, they realized that there was more to this than met the eye. There was, there was more to this law and to, to God's claim on his people. And see, David saw beyond the commandment as a code of conduct, and he actually loved the law because he was able to see it as a revelation of the character of God. Uh, this is something that we know today, but... but when the law was given, this is not something that, that was commonly, commonly seen. And as time progressed, he revealed through his prophets what, what was going to come to pass. Specifically uh, through Jeremiah, um, he, he articulated this, But this shall be the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts. See, this is, this is something that hadn't happened before. And I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. See, this is the desire of God even from the very beginning when he created man. That um, God would not allow the image that he had invested in mankind to remain marred. It's true and its ultimate purpose would be realized, that men would be united to him in nature and identity, that he might be pleased to dwell with them and be glorified in them. 
Now, knowing what would befall him in yet a short period of time, our Savior chooses his words very intentionally in this petition to the Father, that, that later when the Holy Spirit called to their remembrance these words, they might be able to be established in their purpose and moving forward in the proclamation of the gospel, confidently and boldly knowing that the intercession which the Lord gave on their behalf concerning this very subject. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now, this is an expression of the Lord's willingness to enter into this purpose, which was purposed before the world began. He prays not only for those who'd followed him on earth, but he reaches forward to those who would come to him as a result of the chosen witnesses speaking what they have seen and what they've heard. Now, this morning, brethren, I want to ask you a question. Have you believed on Jesus through the word which the apostles spoke concerning him? Have you believed through the report and the account of Jesus Christ delivered to us by these faithful witnesses? Well, if the answer is yes, then this prayer was prayed for you also. Uh, th this prayer has been an encouragement to many wayfaring pilgrims such as ourselves throughout the ages that our Savior, our Advocate on high, our merciful and our faithful High Priest, the, the God-Man, Jesus Christ himself, has prayed for us concerning this matter. This is something that I don't think I'd seen to the degree that I have as, as I've been looking at this, that he prayed this prayer for me as well. But for, for all of those who will believe because of the, the, the witness. Now, the first thing that our Lord asked for in this text is that those who will believe will be one. In our text, there's at least two aspects of this unity which he's praying for. Firstly, that we would be one amongst ourselves, that we would be unified together as one body. Now, sin, in addition to causing a separation and a scattering of mankind from its maker, also caused men to dwell in fundamental disunity with one another. Even in the world, when men unite together for ignoble purposes, there's no real unity in it at work. See, each man joins himself to the cause for ultimately selfish intentions. And in the world, even love, as it is, as it is um, operates um, according to this selfish principle. If, if it were to be broken down to its true intentions, often when somebody says that they love somebody else, they really just love the way that person makes them feel. You know, it, it's a selfish thing. It's not really a, a, something for wanting that other person's benefit. It's, it's selfish. And if this is true, then it ought to be noted that regeneration causes men to be selfless. That we, we see ourselves not as individuals, but as members of the whole. This, is a, the, uh, this prayer being answered as, as we um, come into Christ. And as such, we strive to do all things to benefit our brethren. See, we're able to perceive the Lord in one another. And as we are able to do this, uh, as we're be able, able to behold the work of the Lord that has been, been wrought in our brethren, this is how we're knit more closely to them. Because we're, we're attracted to, to, to the God that we see in them, to, to the work that he has done in them. Now, being alone in the world, men will teach you that you have to look out for number one. You know? To, to, to do what you can get and to obtain for yourself. They'll say, it's a jungle out there, you know. Uh, if, if, you don't, if you don't fight for yourself, then nobody will. You know, the survival of the fittest. Yeah. But uh, contrary to what men may think, it's actually to your advantage to not seek after power and glory for yourself. So you will actually gain more by having a low self-esteem. Because in doing so, you will be highly esteemed of God. And, and this is actually the math of the heavenly economy, that, that one minus one equals an, an, a number no man can number. See, if you seek after the good of the brethren, then in return you have a multitude unnumbered brethren who are doing the same for you. Yeah. You actually gain much more than you could ever gain by seeking selfishly after your own benefit. Yeah. Uh, now, this, this unity that the Lord is praying for is much more than mere fleshly camaraderie. I mean, we, we don't meet together just because we all believe, kind of believe the same thing and we want to come together because we have all these things in common. Well, we do have things in common, but we fellowship with another on a spiritual level because of our common ancestry in Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah. 
See, we are all partakers of the same spirit here. We've all been given eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've all been reconciled to God. And it is on this basis that we meet together and are able to have fellowship and be unified. Uh, this is, in my estimation, the reason why men have a propensity to approach believers with this rigid, law-like mentality, because they don't have a grasp on this truth, that believers in the new covenant operate from a standpoint of reconciliation and not in quest of it. See, the, the true church, the body of Christ, is united. When we are born into Christ, we are brought into this fellowship of the saints. Made, we're made a part of the extended family of God. <laughs> Uh, despite the, the divisions that exist within the institutions of mankind, it, it, we're, it's not a, t a matter of achieving unity, but, but a matter of operating and continuing in the unity in which we've been placed in the body of Christ. It's actually, and it's actually possible to preach texts that we find in the epistle in a way that make them sound more like an old covenant command than a new covenant exhortation. And I, I wanted to give an example of this. When, um, Paul uh, or Peter in First Peter here, he says, "Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through sp the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the Word of God." See, the legalists would take this text and say, "We have to love one another." You know, the thing is, we're just not loving each other enough. You know, if we got to do that. You better love one another. Uh, but what the real spirit of this text is he, he appeals to their pure conversion, that they've obeyed the truth. They've been put into Christ and being led by the spirit, they, they have this unfeigned love of the, of the brethren. So this uh, love that can't be commanded, it can't be accomplished by discipline, this affection for the brethren has been given to them. And he says, see that you love one another. In other words, don't frustrate the inclination that you already have towards your brethren. Now you notice whenever there's an exhortation given to believers in the epistles, it's always couched within the context of revelation. And what, what we should do becomes obvious as we have a grasp on the truth as it is in Christ. Uh, another example of this in 1 Corinthians, he says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He's saying, enter into this thing that you've been brought into. Embrace it. Don't allow anything, don't allow anything to come in that would be a stumbling block to this. Uh, this being said, when you talk to the people of God, you ought not to speak to them as if they were disobedient and far from God. I understand that there are times when because of something else being entered in, seeking to draw them away from the truth that, that is in Christ, that it's necessary to speak, with, to, speak to people with more severity. Uh, and there, there, if there's error to be addressed, it cannot be assumed that everything is all right. But to, our default should not be to bludgeon the brethren. <laughs> but to appeal to the sensitivity of the brethren in the spirit, to appeal to the new man to, to do what is proper from the standpoint of divine affirmation. So secondly, concerning this, this unity, he prays for them, and the, the glory which thou gavest to me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may, they may be made perfect in one. So in continuing to pray for those who are now and would be later followers of him, he prays expressly concerning the manner of our unity, that they would not only be unified together amongst themselves, but that as a body they would be unified with Christ and God. Yeah, he's actually prayed, this is an encouragement, that he has prayed for us that we would be successful for acclimating ourselves for our heavenly occupation. See, we're, we're not being made only to be unified with one another in our redemption, but to be together in aggregate, a habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, our perfection doesn't happen exclusively on an individual level because in Christ, we don't live before God as individuals primarily. We live as members in particular. We've been called in one body. We've been called to be the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem. Uh, this is the desire of the Godhead from the very beginning, to have another personality to enter into this divine fellowship. 
This is the profundity of what we have been made for, that we will be on that day when Christ presents us to himself a perfect reflection of his glory and full, complete partakers of the eternal life which we have now been given in measure. Now, this aspect of our salvation is one that's a, it's a common jumping off point from many words that are delivered to the believers in the epistles. If this is true, that we have been joined to Christ and we are meant to increase in this unity as a body to the final result that we will be forever with the Lord, then what does that mean for us in the present? To, to be sure, there are many implications which must be drawn from this. And here we see yet another example of how the truth, when it is preached, it draws out impl implications which are a cause for exhortation. I just wanted to give a few examples of this. In Colossians 3, he says, If ye then be then risen with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. Why? For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. If Christ is your life, if this is true, if you've been raised up to sit with him in heavenly places, then what business do you have living with your eyes on the world? How can you not look above to the places where you are meant to dwell? Why are you looking downward at the earth? It doesn't make any sense. He, he appeals to them on the basis of this affirmation. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How can we do this? How is this even possible? You notice how he reasons here. He doesn't say you're dead to sin, so you better make sure you don't live in your sins anymore. He appeals to the truth. You are dead to sin. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How is this even possible? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. And yet again, this is another one of the texts that the legalists have gotten a hold of and ruined. You know, you really ought to be walking in newness of life. You, walk in newness of life. Hey, if you're born again, you better start acting like it. You know, I, I've actually heard people say this before. Now, this is the manner of the kingdom, that we walk in the life that we have been given. This is, this is just an affirmation that he's making. The very resurrection of life that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in us. And if this is the case, then we should walk in newness of life. That is the design of God in redemption. And uh, one more example in, in 1 Corinthians. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the, the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So the, the truth of this indwelling, the, the divine moving into man, is one which provokes much thought. And it actually has a practical application to us in the present. If you are the temple of God and he has given his spirit to dwell within you, then how can you involve yourself in things which you once gave yourself to? Well, what does he say? What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? This doesn't make any sense. If you, if, you are, if you are to join in this body of people who will act as a repository of the glory of God throughout eternity, how can you use your vessel in the present to, to carry defiled cargo, so to speak? Yeah. It makes things a lot more simple when you see things from this, this kind of a perspective. So he, he prays for them concerning this unity, and, and moving on, he says, And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou loved me. Uh, this last week, as I was looking into this, I, I thought, how is it that God has loved Jesus? Well, what is the basis and the manner of the love of God towards Jesus? As I've been able to see it, God doesn't love the Son primarily because of his own loving nature and desire to love. But he loves the Son because the Son is lovable. He always does the things that please the Father. See, he consented to come down to the earth and a man, as a man to die for the sin of man. He is holy and harmless. He is blameless and righteous. Therefore, God loves the Son. He loves him because of who he is to him. He is worthy of love. So then Jesus prays that God would love them as he has loved him. 
Uh, this is realized in being given to be in God's favor. See, this favor and impartation of blamelessness, yea, even the very righteousness of God in Christ, makes men able to experience the shedding forth of the very same love that God showed towards His Son in their hearts, the same manner of love. This is an answer to so much strife and confusion in the church of our day that, that God has not changed himself and what he loves to be able to love you. But he has changed mankind and he has made mankind lovable. That's, that's the key. And this is how the world knows. This is the confirmation of the testimony of Christ, that the believer has an experiential righteousness that is manifested by their outward, visible conversation. That the favor of God is evident in this way. So he continues and he says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Uh, this, is direction, this is the direction in which all of this is headed. The joining together of the people and the transformation of them into the image of Christ is unto the, prese the presentation of them unto himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Well, we see in this prayer the desire of our Lord to see these things be accomplished. He speaks earlier in the chapter uh, almost as if the deed was already done. I have finished my work and, and now glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. See, he's, he's looking forward to this. He still had yet to endure the final and bitter chapter of his life on earth. Yet, for the joy that was set before him, he was ready to endure the cross. In his heart, he projected himself to the end of these things, and that enabled him to endure such contradiction of sinners against himself. That they might behold my glory. See, he longs for the wedding feast when he will be united with his bride to enjoy the fruits of his labor and in sweet communion share with them the abundance of heaven. See, he wants to be known of his people. And in this, he has left for us a picture of how we overcome our affliction and opposition in this present world. We consider that the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with what? With the glory that shall be revealed in us. Amen. See, we look on for the joy that is set before us, so to speak, that we might be forever with the Lord. And as I was thinking upon this expectation of our Lord to be joined to his bride this last week, I was reminded of... Um, uh, the Holy War by our, our, our brother John Bunyan. When the town of Mansoul was delivered from the occupation of Diabolus and the Di Diabolonians, and Prince Emmanuel came to dwell with them, how he often desired to walk about the city and be with his people. He, 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 he held feasts at his palace for them to attend. He even made house calls to individual men. And, and, and when he wasn't able to be with them, he sent them presents and he sent them treats. So great was his affection for them that he could hardly stay away from his people. He, he was found out in the court so often. If you're not careful, it can be easy for you to forget this, that the Lord did not go through all that he has gone through for naught, but that you are as his inheritance and he is jealous for you. And this allegory of the holy war, the, the people of the town of Mansoul, after having been delivered from the tyranny of Di Diabolus, they were lulled into a false sense of security by one who was a mixed breed of a native of the town of Mansoul and, and a D D Diabolonian, who made them to think that uh, by their state of feast and favor, they didn't need to spend as much time with the prince as they had. Uh, they had been elevated to such a state that, of safety that they no longer needed him. And, the, and so they would have their own feasts. And so as a result of this, when the Lord came around to visit his people, he found their doors shut unto him. And he would knock. And when they didn't answer, he left. And after a time of no one opening up to him, he just stopped coming by. And after a time when no one came to his palace to visit him, he left the city with the people unawares. They didn't even know that he had left. See, the Lord has this jealousy for his people that he will not tolerate them giving themselves to any other things. When this is seen, it ought to cause us to long for him also and desire to make ourselves ready for his return so that when he comes to us, we will be a bride worthy of his marriage, worthy of what he has done to obtain us. See, we are now in this stance of, of making ourselves ready for when the bridegroom cometh. So in closing, brethren, I wanted to read um, 
this text in the second chapter of Ephesians, I thought this is a, a, a very good summary of what we have read today. I don't think I could have put it better myself. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened, together, quickened us together with Christ. And he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And, and, and what is this all for? What is this pointing to? That in the ages to come, we might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. This is what we're looking forward to, brethren. Thank you.